Alright, so for those of you unfamiliar, a couple of months ago I put out a video talking about Assassin's Creed, the first entry in the long-running and expansive Assassin's Creed franchise. I had a lot of fun playing through the game, and it was also a really rewarding title to discuss, so even during production there was never any doubt in my mind I would eventually be taking a look at the sequel, Assassin's Creed 2. If you haven't already pieced it together, that's exactly what we're going to be doing today. But before we launch in, there are a couple of things we need to cover. For starters, if you haven't already seen my original Assassin's Creed video, I suggest you pause this one and go give it a watch. It's certainly not like required viewing or anything to understand this discussion, but I think it's pretty decent though I say it myself, and come on, we're doing a sequel. It's always going to be better if you're familiar with the original. Now you may remember we actually ran into a similar conundrum with the first title. Being an older game, it released on older consoles, namely the 360 and PS3. Typically this would mean the best place to play is on PC, but unfortunately AC was so old it didn't even include Steam achievements, so if you were to play it there you'd be missing out on a significant amount of content. Now luckily, in that case, the Xbox Series and its excellent backwards compatibility came to the rescue, and I was able to play through the 360 release at 4K 60fps with all achievements intact, the undoubted definitive experience. Unfortunately though, things aren't quite as straightforward for AC2. At first glance, we actually appear to be better off. We start out in pretty much the same boat, released on older consoles, no achievements on Steam, even though... It was 2009, they definitely could have been included. It's all pretty familiar. Where things differ though is that the second entry in the franchise has actually received a proper HD remastering treatment on more modern platforms. The Ezio Collection takes Assassin's Creed 2, Brotherhood, and Revelations, the second, third, and fourth entries in the franchise respectively, and bundles them together to be enjoyed on Xbox One or PlayStation 4, all at a dazzling 1080p. 30 FPS. This collection is widely considered to be a little lazy, but hey, if that's the best we have, it's the best we have. Thankfully though, it's not. This is where things get a little complicated. So, a few years after the collection released, Ubisoft dropped a free patch, allowing it to run at higher resolutions on the more powerful PS4 Pro. For some reason though, despite Microsoft having a similar console in the form of the Xbox One X, gamers on the green team were left completely out of luck. Yeah, it's time for the first of many. Boo Ubisoft. They wouldn't be left out forever though, because a whopping half decade later Microsoft would make available their FPS Boost technology, a feature which, and I cannot possibly gas up Xbox enough for their backwards compatibility support, these guys are awesome, would allow a slew of older games to run at higher frame rates on their newer systems, without any kind of update from the developers. This has led to a really bizarre situation though, whereby thanks to two completely unrelated events, on PlayStation 5 the game runs at 4K, 30 FPS, while on Xbox Series it runs at 1080p, 60 FPS. Why can't things ever just be simple? Most of the time I'm used to these things having an obvious correct answer, but this one really doesn't. Sure, I mean, if you were to catch me in a particularly Nintendo-hating mood, you might be able to get me quoted as saying that 30 FPS is an unplayable abomination to all sorts of religious deities. But, like, realistically, this isn't a first-person shooter, and I mean, I would notice 1080p. The original title looked fantastic in 4K. What ended up being the tiebreaker for me was actually something completely unrelated. Achievement distribution. You see, on Xbox, collections like this just have all of their achievements grouped together into one big list. They're all there, the completion process is identical, you just don't get credit for having 100% completed anything until you've 100% completed all three games, and even then you only get to display the collection as a whole on your profile. On PlayStation though, you have the trophy list system, whereby in many collections like this one the same achievements are split into three separate trophy lists with three separate platinum trophies, allowing you to display all three of them proudly on your profile. So, 4K30 it is, I guess. Let's hop on the PlayStation 5, and I'll give you my official take on Assassin's Creed 2. Assassin's Creed 2 is a direct continuation of the first game, picking up mere seconds after the conclusion of its predecessor. You once again are put in the shoes of 21st century bartender Desmond Miles, now attempting to escape from the secure facility who is being held in by the enigmatic Abstergo Industries. With the help of former somewhat sympathetic assistant lady, revealed deep cover fellow assassin Lucy Stillman, the pair are able to escape to a top secret assassin safe house with the intention of once again having Desmond relive his ancestor's genetic memories, this time in order to super speed his training process and transform him into a master assassin. We won't be diving back into the life of Altair though, instead we'll be strapped into the much more comfortable 
colorful, if less futuristic looking, Animus 2.0, seeing through the eyes of Ezio Auditore da Firenze, a young nobleman living in Italy during the Renaissance period. Ezio's carefree life is quickly turned on its head when his father and brothers are all executed, betrayed by a supposed ally. It is at this point that Ezio learns he is descended from a long line of assassins, and together with his uncle Mario and a group of close associates, sets out to continue his father's work and to get vengeance against all those who have wronged him. If I had to make just one comment on this setup, it would probably have to be that, as compared to the first game, it was a little bit easier to follow. Ezio's storyline doesn't expect you to take in quite as much, quite as quickly, and frankly, since a larger portion of the characters introduced actually have ongoing plot relevance, they're a little more memorable than the relative randos you spend time with in the opening of AC1. This all comes with a caveat though, because I feel like part of the reason they were able to accomplish this in the first place is that the opening of Assassin's Creed 2 drags on even longer than that of its predecessor. It does the whole thing where like, you start playing as a younger version of your character and you have to work your way through to adulthood before you're able to fully utilize all of the mechanics. It's a fairly standard setup, and I mean, credit where it's due, this entry at least doesn't subject you to any contextless white void tutorials. Plus, since the story does a slightly better job of getting you invested this time around, it does make it a little easier to abide by the handholding. Sadly though, it's just not enough to compensate for the sheer length of this opening. We're on the second game. If anything, you would anticipate being able to get into the meat of the gameplay faster than before, presumably already being somewhat familiar with the core mechanics. It actually managed to get me again though, wondering like, is the entire game gonna be like this? It took four hours before I could even start to do things that didn't feel like tutorials. It almost had me missing the white void. At least there, things were streamlined and ended in a timely manner. It wasn't even a clean break either, just a gradual fade out. It took forever for the game to start feeling less railroaded, but I think we'll come back to that in a little bit. Once you get set up in your uncle's villa, you'll finally be free to branch out a tad and explore the magnificent land of Italia, at which point you can really get up to some mischief. Once he's completed his assassin training, Ezio really lives up to his predecessor. You'll be dealing with an almost identical moveset, allowing you to parkour your way through large cities with relative ease. Chaining together a number of different moves always feels great, and really instills the feeling of moving effortlessly through the night. Speaking of the night, there's a day cycle now, just one of the many visual updates made for AC2. Unfortunately, uh, this is like the only positive one though. In my opinion, this title is a significant step backwards visually. Some of my criticisms are more or less objective. The models don't look as good for some reason. I mean, don't get me wrong, there were some janky characters in the first entry, but like, in a charming way, I never found it distracting. The sequel, by contrast, is awash with PlayStation 2 geometry, and not even late PS2 geometry. Look at Mario over here, he just looks goofy. The fact that the voice acting is actually really good too almost makes it worse, it feels anachronistic. That and the pop-in, you will very frequently see people and building textures just manifest into existence well within the visible play space, which is not a great look. On the subjective side, this title is a lot more colorful. It feels like they wanted to go for a slightly more whimsical art style, and it looks really nice. Certain areas of Italy, like Ezio's hometown of Florence, are absolutely gorgeous, thanks in no small part to its aesthetic similarities with a Renaissance painting. Personally though, I think I prefer the more gritty and realistic style of the first game. This is kind of the opposite of what you would expect, but I actually feel like it's aged more gracefully. Something there should be no debate on, however, is the soundtrack. Across the board improvement in every way. AC1 didn't really have much of a soundtrack, but this title has some bangers, and a real cult following, which isn't super surprising given its inspiration. Something else that should be immediately familiar is the combat. As Ezio, you will once again be able to absolutely shred through horde after horde of enemies with a lot of methodical tapping of the right trigger and the X button. It feels as good as ever. Deflecting enemy attacks and delivering devastating insta-kill counters will never not be satisfying, and Ezio even has a few new tricks up his sleeve to keep things feeling fresh. In addition to the lineup from the last game in AC2, you'll have all kinds of new weapons at your disposal. One of them's a gun. As the story progresses, you'll gain access to things like poison darts, smoke bombs, and even pocket sand that can help smooth over various situations you might encounter. You can even disarm guards and gain access to all sorts of alternate armaments like longer or heavier weapons. Sadly though, this is one of those systems that I just never felt much need to engage with. I know I complained about endless tutorializing just a few paragraphs back, but most of these abilities are things you have to go out of your way to learn how to use, and your standard sword and especially your hidden blade are always going to get the job done just as well if not better, so nothing else ever caught my attention. One thing that did immediately catch my attention though is the new health system. I hate it and it's worse in every possible way. 
The first game did not have health, it had a synchronization meter. It tracked a few things, but in most situations it was your analog for HP. It decreased when you got hit or something, and then it would fill back up as you played well and brought yourself back in sync with your ancestor's genetic memories. This worked perfectly. It did not need to be modified at all. So for the sequel, they decided to completely rework it, and it's terrible, and I hate it. It's still technically called the same thing, but it works just like a health bar now, and it no longer regens. Yeah, if you take damage, you'll need to make your way to a doctor or use some of your limited supply of expendable med kits to get back in top shape. This is stupid for a variety of reasons, but to keep it brief, instant healing while in combat is insanely overpowered, so to balance it out as the game attempts to ramp up difficulty, they just have to design enemies that do a ridiculous amount of damage in a single hit. This just plays into the OP medkit system though, and means that towards the end of the game you have to run and restock them after, like, every fight. Outside of combat is barely any better. In what universe would I prefer to have to spend money to heal every time I happen to miss a jump? The health system actually makes the parkour more frustrating, because if you sustain any damage it now takes effort to undo. That's not even to mention that it's also just inherently lamer. The cool overtly video gamey elements of the Animus were part of what made the first game so cool, so to see them get paired back even a little bit is really unfortunate. None of that is actually that big a deal though. It all works well enough to support the core gameplay loop, so what does it look like? Well, one of the biggest complaints levied against the first game was that it was extremely repetitive. It centered around nine assassinations, and they were all basically the same, rinse and repeat until the credits roll. When I played for myself, I was fairly vocal about the fact that this didn't bother me. I liked that I always knew I was going to be doing something I enjoyed, and the loop contained enough variety to hold my attention throughout. That said though, I will not be criticizing Assassin's Creed 2 for its more varied gameplay. Almost every other person on the planet would consider it a huge improvement. It's executed well enough, and even I can see the merit it brings to the table. It is, however, worth pointing out that AC2 doesn't have much of a gameplay loop, as it were. You kind of just jump from story beat to story beat, doing whatever the plot calls for at the moment, which is a totally acceptable progression structure, but it does mean that you won't be traveling linearly throughout the world. This game's map is about the same size as the first one, but it's broken up into much more irregularly shaped cities and villages, some of which you may revisit several times. One thing I do really like is that, as opposed to the cookie-cutter districts of the first game, AC2 takes you through a much more varied landscape. Cities are still going to be your bread and butter, which is obviously good, but it's interesting to see the Assassin's Creed gameplay formula play out in some slightly flatter areas, for instance. It actually works really well. And plus, there's a lot more aesthetic diversity, allowing you to experience a larger number of distinct locales. The flip side of this, though, is that you spend way too much time in Venice, IMO. I don't love the new swimming mechanic, which it makes heavy use of, and it's just one of the less enjoyable regions in the game, if you ask me, especially compared to how much time you spend there. As for what you'll be doing in these locations, for the most part, it's pretty standard fare, just couched differently. You'll still be using a combination of parkour and social stealth to make your way through large areas in order to complete short missions and carry out assassinations. This game actually has a somewhat heavier emphasis on assassinations, honestly. A lot of what you'll be doing involves taking out specific targets frequently without being spotted. These are always fun, getting an instant kill with your hidden blade is one of the most gratifying things you can do. But I would like to note that there are so many of these that when it finally comes time for a big kill, they feel much less memorable. Without rewatching my footage, I could honestly only remember like two of them off the top of my head. Luckily, with this increased emphasis on stealth, the system surrounding it received a massive overhaul, and it's a huge improvement. You can now blend into any sufficiently large crowd, making you functionally invisible and giving you way more opportunities to quickly vanish after breaking the law. In the first game, you could only do this with small groups of dedicated scholars, which was basically useless, so this is a big step in a positive direction. I was also initially pretty impressed with the new notoriety system, whereby you can bribe heralds off snitches or tear down posters to make yourself less noticeable to guards. In practice, though, keeping on top of this is just kind of annoying, and the way it worked in the first game honestly didn't need change, so... I would describe the rest of your tasks as, like, miscellaneous. You'll deliver letters occasionally, and there are a lot of escort missions where you, like, have to deliver an NPC somewhere. I know people usually hate these, but they're honestly pretty okay here. The NPCs are actually competent, so the process isn't agonizing. No matter what you're doing, though, you can expect it to somehow involve the core mechanics in such a way that you're never hurting for a fix of any one. The game story ends up taking you through many years of Ezio's life, during which time you get to see him grow as both a person and as an assassin, while still maintaining the personality that made him likable in the first place. 
dies. All the while, the supporting ensemble continues to grow, introducing a number of new characters that will help Ezio on his journey. The first game didn't really have much of a supporting cast, but I'm happy to report that their first crack at it was successful, with characters like Leonardo da Vinci, Claudia, and of course your Uncle Mario all being genuinely enjoyable to see on screen, while making meaningful contributions to your progression. As for the story itself though, while I still think it's an improvement, I would say it is so by a much less significant margin. One thing I really liked about Altair's story was its moral ambiguity. While the assassins were obviously loosely framed as the good guys, Altair had very little qualms about accomplishing his goals by ethically dubious means, and the game wasn't afraid to portray your targets as people with depth and even sympathetic motivations. By contrast, Assassin's Creed 2 is much more of a revenge story, with clearly defined good guys and bad guys. Ezio actually doesn't even officially join the Italian Brotherhood until what was supposed to be the second to last act, which is fine, narratively speaking, this is a trilogy, but there is a part of me that, while appreciating that we got a better story, wishes we could have gotten a better assassin story. Luckily, this time, the link between Ezio and Desmond's storylines are a lot more clear, although I was a little disappointed we didn't see nearly as much of Desmond as we did in the first game. The time we do get with him, though, is a lot denser, and I felt like the modern-day plot got moved forward in a really intriguing way. Minor spoiler alert for both storylines, but the past and present narratives reach their climaxes at exactly the same time, in what is a genuinely really well written and compelling moment, before leaving us off with a much less frustrating and much better earned cliffhanger. We also get to learn a lot more about the lore of this world through the logs of Subject 16, notes left in the Animus by its previous inhabitant in the form of runes. You'll have to track these down scattered all across the world, and they're fairly well hidden, in addition to requiring annoyingly difficult puzzles to decrypt. It's totally worth it though, because these are probably the most interesting parts of the game. Basically, from what I've pieced together so far, Subject 16 essentially lost his mind and his ability to distinguish between his life and those of his ancestors after being forced to spend sometimes days strapped in the Animus. Some of these voice logs genuinely gave me chills. Hats off to Cam Clark, the voice acting here is phenomenal, and I really hope we get to learn more about what exactly happened to him in future entries. Tracking down all of these runes is predictably one of the many prerequisites for 100% completion, so with the story finished, I guess we should talk about that now. For starters, in terms of trophies, in addition to those you'll get for completing the story, you can expect your fair share of the basics. Kill X amount of people in Y way, spend A amount of money on B, that sort of thing. The kind of achievements that serve to highlight uh, how few of the game's mechanics you meaningfully interacted with during your playthrough. Other than those though, the majority of your attention will be split between collectible hunting, maxing out your uncle's villa, and completing all of the assassin's tombs. In addition to codex pages, which you have to get all of for the story anyway, and subject 16 runes, the primary collectible in this game is feathers, which function nearly identically to flags in the first entry. Feathers are far less numerous though, there are only 100 of them total as compared to the 420 flags we had to track down last time. This of course means that while there are fewer of them in all, tracking down any individual one is going to be a bit more difficult. Add on to that the fact that this game unfortunately once again has basically zero collectible tracking, and you're probably going to need the services of a website like mapgenie.io if you want to find them all. The Assassin's Tombs, on the other hand, are basically on the exact opposite end of the spectrum. There are only six of them, but they each involve a lengthy mission, usually centered around parkour before you can claim your prize. In addition to several associated trophies, in exchange for completing all of these, you actually unlock a suit of Altair's armor, which is a pretty awesome reward. The tombs themselves, though, uh, kind of suck. Most of them are honestly just drawn out obstacle courses, and half of them are timed. Really, it feels like the majority of them were barely playtested, if at all. I've complained before about the amount of context sensitivity the first game had in its parkour system, and it's basically unchanged in the sequel. Normally, it's pretty easy to just cope with or try to work around, but these tombs push it well past its limit. Ezio kind of just does his own thing, your controller inputs feel more like suggestions than commands, and when this causes you to have to start a long and difficult section over again, it's always going to be frustrating. You know what else I found frustrating? Maxing out the villa, but not for the reason you may think. This is a pretty interesting little side mission that involves tracking down collectibles and investing money into upgrading the surrounding town in order to increase the value of your base. Lots of things increase this total, from buying weapons to gathering feathers to putting in coin directly. This would probably be a pretty satisfying process, 
if the cutoff for the trophy wasn't 80%, which is uh, not how 100% works. Sure, this saves you from having to do some things that realistically are not compelling, like buying every suit of armor for no reason, but if that was the intention, they should have just dropped that as a requirement. Like, either make this percentage significant or don't, but you can't tie it to an achievement and then say, actually, it's only 80% important. It doesn't work like that. This game actually has several things that aren't represented by a trophy that I feel realistically should be. Like, why don't you have to find all of the viewpoints? Points, but more importantly, why are there so many optional missions? Like, guys, there are no optional missions in 100%. These are mostly more assassination contracts, beat-up missions, or races, kind of reminiscent of what you were doing in the last title. All you get for these is money you don't really need, so honestly, I would have been fine with the setup if they hadn't have bothered to track them in such intimate detail, complete with another percentage. It just calls attention to the fact that these aren't included. Ultimately, the trophy list is fine, it covers all the important bits, but I would be lying if I said I didn't think it felt less comprehensive than that of the first game, especially given how much more different types of content this one added. Honestly, I feel like my biggest problem with the completion process is just that there's never really a good time to do it. The first game may have been massively repetitive, but the loop was big enough that you had plenty of time to 100% an area before you left it. Meanwhile, in this game, while well, you can technically do collectibles or whatever at any time, it always felt like maybe I'd be better off waiting until I'd wrapped up the story there, and by the time I did that, I had already moved on to the next town. I think this game is supposed to feel a lot more open, and on paper it technically is, but in practice it ended up feeling like an almost entirely railroaded experience followed by a massive cleanup. There's nothing wrong with that, inherently, but I definitely found the way AC1 handled things to be a little bit more graceful, even if it was still satisfying to grab the Platinum Trophy. It took me just under 40 hours to 100% complete Assassin's Creed 2, just an hour or so longer than the first game, and ultimately, I really enjoy the process. I don't want this video to come off as overly negative, because at the end of the day, this is a really solid title, and I would even go so far as to say that most people would probably enjoy it more than the first, completionist included. I've already done a video on the franchise, so I can't just repeat ad nauseum how compelling the swordplay is or how fun it is bouncing across rooftops, but the blood of Assassin's Creed is still here, and in many ways stronger than ever. I'm sure this game was revolutionary when it came out. It takes a serious crack at moving towards a more open world format in a lot of ways that I didn't even talk about that much, but in the modern day landscape of much more fleshed out open world titles, being able to dye your outfit or buy paintings for your bedroom just doesn't wow me. And with that in mind, a lot of the features this game adds that are intended to give the player more choices ultimately end up coming across as more bloat that distracts from what could have otherwise been a more streamlined title. At the end of the day though, I had a really good time with this game, and I would definitely recommend it to anybody who loved the original. Additionally, if you didn't love the original, you know, had some problems with it, honestly, I would probably recommend this one to you even more strongly. It makes some updates to the established mechanics that most people seem to think are very worthwhile. As for me, I'm hoping this game represents growing pains for the franchise. It's a step forward in so many ways, but I'd be lying if I said I agreed with every choice they made in the process. Hopefully, the next game in the series, Brotherhood, is able to bridge the gap, but that's going to have to wait for next time. Until then, this is another title I'm proud to have on my list of 100% completed games. Am I going to get crucified for criticizing everybody's favorite Assassin's Creed? Hopefully not, but if this video did make you angry, consider getting subscribed so you can hate watch the next one. I'd feel a lot better about it though if you actually enjoyed the video, so if you did, how about letting me know by dropping a like, getting subscribed, ringing the bell, and if you're feeling particularly ambitious, dropping a comment letting me know what you thought. I'd love to hear from you, so start a discussion. What was your first Assassin's Creed game? Which Assassin's Creed game is your favorite? What did you think about Assassin's Creed 2? Be creative. Finally, once you're done with that, if you just can't get enough of me, you can follow me on all of my social media. I post on TikTok now, so if you want to check that out, the link will be in the description along with any of the music that I used in this video. I think that's going to be it for this one, so hopefully I see you in the next one, and as always, thanks for watching.